Okay, we are live. So welcome to yet another micro seminar and today we are very excited to share our friend Paul Carini with you. Paul had gotten his PhD at Oregon State University and is currently in a postdoctoral at Horn Point Lab and I'll let him tell you what he's going to be doing next. Uh, and today we're going to hear about some of the mysteries of SAR-11 and so Paul, please take it away. All right, so let me share my screen here. Okay, we all good? It's coming, it looks good. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, um, thank you to Jen and Cameron for inviting me uh, to give this seminar. It's really awesome. Uh, the micro seminar is awesome. Hats off to both of you for making this the success that it is. I'm really honored to be a part of it. Um, so today I'm going to talk to all of you about what was essentially the third chapter of my PhD dissertation work where I investigated uh, some of the strategies that SAR-11 marine bacteria employ for surviving phosphate stress. Uh, this TEM, oops, ah, apparently I can't click that. Okay, uh, this TEM image in the background is actually SAR-11 cells. Uh, we haven't actually nailed it, but we were trying to identify these little granules as polyphosphate granules. Um, I'm not sure where that research stands now, but that's the reason we took this image. So before I get into the details of that work, I want to thank all the people that helped me get here, both um, the people in my PhD, my current postdoc. Uh, so Steve Giovanoni was my PhD advisor. I had a fantastic run in his lab. While I was there, I had the opportunity to work with an outstanding undergraduate, Emily Campbell. She's co-author on three of my papers. Uh, she recently was accepted to a number of graduate programs, and I believe she's picked one. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to announce that or not, but um, about where it is exactly. Uh, but I'm very proud of her and the work that she's done. Looking forward to seeing her work down the road. I co-first authored a paper with Angel White that we'll talk about today, and then Cameron, Ben, Helen, and Jan Lin all contributed significantly to the work I'm going to show you, and the rest of those folks contributed to my other papers. Currently, I'm a postdoc in Allison Santoro's lab at Horn Point in Cambridge, Maryland, uh, where I'm working with Marine Thalmarkia. Um, we have a paper in prep I'm very excited about, very stoked uh, to get submitted in the next month or so. And as I alluded to on, on one of my uh, tweets about a week ago, um, I have a new gig lined up. I'm very happy to announce that I will be transitioning this summer. I've been awarded a series visiting postdoc fellowship to work with Noah Fearer at uh, CU Boulder in soil communities. So this may be a temporary hiatus. It may be a more permanent hiatus from uh, marine microbiology, but uh, very excited to get that ball rolling. So let's get started by explaining what SAR-11 bacteria are. Uh, in the late, mid to late 1980s, when all the molecular tools of the molecular revolution sort of made their way through uh, to microbial ecology, Steve Giovanoni, who is my PhD advisor, used these tools to investigate some of the genetic diversity in the Sargasso Sea. So what he did is went out and collected Sargasso Sea seawater, um, amplified or isolated the total genomic DNA amplified 16S ribosomal RNAs from it, cloned them, sequenced them, and then constructed a molecular phylogeny that looks something like this. What he found is that two groups of organisms, the SAR-7 cluster, Sargasso C clone number 7, and SAR-11 cluster, Sargasso C clone number 11, were abnormally abundant and unusually deeply rooting for an organism, uh, organisms for these types of studies. SAR-7 is most related to the oxygenic phototrophs. This really ends up being prochlorococcus and or synococcus, depending on where you cut that line. And SAR-11 was a deeply rooting alpha proteobacteria that really hadn't been seen before. Uh, he really identified the significance of this finding quite quickly and dedicated most of the rest of his career to understanding the ecology of these organisms, uh, how they're distributed, what their role in the environment is, and some of the uh, paths that they've taken evolutionarily to end up where they are today. Fast forward 25 years, we now know these cells are globally distributed. Uh, this is a little bit outdated now, um, but it's a map showing where SAR-11-16S genes have been identified in the world. If you were to update this, 
there would obviously be more little dots on this map um, than there are currently. There are about 10 to the 28th cells globally. At least that's, an, that's what we estimate. So to put that in perspective, if you were to take all of the SAR-11 cells in the ocean and put them into a big pile of biomass, you'd have roughly the same amount of biomass as all the fish in the sea. So that's a ton of biomass. Actually, that's more than a ton of biomass. That's a lot more than a ton of biomass. Um, the Sargasso Sea uh, is located right here where the uh, original sequences were obtained from. And what I'm going to show you now are some dynamics of SAR-11 populations in the Sargasso Sea and really why I got interested in phosphate metabolism in general. So this is published data uh, from Craig Carlson, 2009 in the ISME Journal. This is a depth profile. Um, this is the surface of the seawater 300 meters down over time uh, for two years. And what we're looking at is the percent of all DAFI counts. So the way to interpret that is the, the percent of all microbes that are SAR-11. And in these red and pink areas, you're seeing up to 50% of the cells, but, but in general, over 30% of the cells in the upper 100 meters are SAR-11. What's really interesting is if you look at phosphate concentrations in the same time span, the same depth profile, there's very little, if any, detectable inorganic phosphate. Typically, um, we're looking at below limits of detection of the method used here. This is from a public data set. Um, if you're interested in mining it, there's a lot of other data in that data set. But there's about 0.2 to 1 nanomolar of phosphate available. So when I look at these two panels side by side, I think either SAR-11 is really good at acquiring those low levels of phosphate, or they have some mechanisms where they can outcompete other organisms cohabitating with them for phosphate. But when you look at the genomes, it's not immediately obvious how they do it. And then even, even if you do identify genes, you have to prove that, that they're actually employing those strategies under phosphate limitation. So just to give you a little bit of a primer, how do microbes in general cope with low phosphate environments? There are four main ways that, that bacteria can cope. The first is that they increase their affinity for phosphate, enabling them to um, acquire traces of phosphate in the environment. The way most microbes do that is by inducing this high affinity phosphate transport operon. So this is PSTS, is a periplasmic binding protein. We have two permease proteins here and an ATPase that form an ABC transporter. So when cells get f low in phosphate, they induce this operon. Oops, sorry. Um, they induce this operon and the, especially this periplasmic binding protein gets secreted on the outside of the cell in very high amount um, that enables uh, them to acquire these very low traces of phosphate. It's a high velocity, high affinity phosphate transport system. This is pretty broadly distributed in bacteria as well, marine bacteria. It's fairly common. The second strategy is to use stored phosphate. So I know there might be a few people that are interested in polyphosphate metabolism. That's where I'm going with this. So when, when phosphate is abundant in the environment, some of that phosphate gets transported into the cell in, and makes its way into ATP. If the cells encode for a polyphosphate kinase, they can take the terminal phosphate off of ATP right here and transfer it to uh, an elongating chain of phosphate residues called polyphosphate. And this can be, these can be quite long. They can form granules in the cell depending on the organism. Um, so that happens under phosphate replete conditions. When they're phosphate starved then, they can induce what's called a polyphosphate exopolyphosphatase to snip off these phosphate residues one at a time and use that phosphate for growth. There are some other things. This may substitute for ATP in certain instances, but, but I'm not going to get into that too much today. The third mechanism is to use alternate phosphorus compounds. These are typically referred to as organophosphorus compounds. There are two broad classes of organophosphorus compounds. There's phosphate esters, which are characterized by a POC bond. Those are cleaved by what can be a secreted enzyme in some organisms. So phytoplankton um, secrete alkaline phosphatases. And the bond between the carbon and the oxygen is cleaved, releasing inorganic phosphate that can be transported into the cell. Other organisms transport that phosphate intact, so they don't actually cleave it outside of the cell. You have an organophosphorus compound in the cell, and some other phosphatase may cleave this inor inorganic phosphate residue from that. Um, something that, in my opinion, is perhaps under-recognized is that 
these phosphorylated compounds can just be directly assimilated into biomass as well. Um, I have not read a lot about this, but if there's a phosphoenopyruvate floating around in the sea, it would make sense to me just to transport it in the cell and assimilate it into uh, glycolysis or gluconeogenesis instead of dephosphorylating it for the phosphate. Um, so that's, that's just an opinion. There's another class of, of molecules that cells can use. These are called phosphonates. They're characterized by a PC bond, so, that, so there's no O in between there. This is a very hard bond to break for bacteria. Typically, these, uh, these compounds are transported in the cell, sometimes by the same transporter that transports the organophosphorus compounds. A CP lyase, which is a multi-subunit enzyme complex, then breaks this bond. It costs the cell energy to break this bond right here, and you have the production of inorganic phosphate and um, your R group as well. So that's um, how to use organophosphorus compounds. There are other pathways, but these are generally thought of as the, as the dominant pathways um, to use organophosphates. And then there's the potential that cells can simply reduce their phosphate content. So the three main sinks of phosphate in a cell are the chromosome, so the, the linkages between nucleotides are phosphorus bonds. Um, we have this, a similar story for ribosomes. So each ribosome has a 16S, a 23S, and a 5S ribosomal RNA. Each one of those has um, some amount of phosphate, and there are hundreds or thousands of ribosomes per cell, depending on the organism. So that's a huge sink for phosphate. And then membrane lipids, specifically phospholipids, are um, a sink for uh, phosphate. So when some cells become starved, they simply reduce the number of ribosomes in their cell and therefore reduce their phosphate quota. Typically these cells aren't super active because they have fewer ribosomes. And then other cells, most notably phytoplankton, actually take all their phospholipids out of the membrane and put some other phosphate-free lipid in its place. Uh, there are a huge diversity of different lipid types. You can have glycolipids, which simply have like a, a sugar or a glucose molecule in their place, or Phytoplankton makes sulfolipids, which is really a sulfated glucose molecule, and some organisms put amino acids in place of phosphate in their lipids that lack phosphorus as well. So these are the four mechanisms. Um, we, I was interested, is there evidence for any of these in SAR-11? So I'm going to introduce the players of our story today, the, the main actors and actresses. Um, I'm not sure which one's the actor and which one's the actress, but uh, we have two isolates. One of them is from the Sargasso Sea. Uh, this is, remember, the phosphate deplete environment. This is strain 7211. We call um, SAR-11 organisms pelagibacteriales. They haven't technically been named yet. And then our second player is um, Candidatus pelagibacter ubique. 10, strain 1062. This was isolated from the relatively phosphate replete Oregon coast. This is the strain that we do most of our physiology work with because it grows fantastic uh, in, in the lab. And it was the first genome sequence and all that stuff as well. So a priori, before I jumped into any experiments, I looked at the genomes because that's kind of what we do today. Um, nowadays is we look at genomes first. So uh, right off the bat, um, I tried to identify which genes might be involved in a phosphate response. So the Oregon Coast strain, so this is the phosphate replete isolate, has this high affinity phosphate transport uh, operon as well as some regulatory proteins here and here. We think that this may be an inorganic, a low affinity inorganic phosphate transporter related to FO4 family of tra transporters. It's immediately upstream of this operon transcribed divergently. But that's it. No evidence for alternate lipid synthesis, no, no evidence for any other potential utilization pathways. Uh, strain 7211 was very different. Um, there were, uh, we identified a number of features that may be indicative of what they do in phosphate stress. They do have the phosphate transport system along with the regulatory proteins. They also have polyphosphate metabolism genes. Some hydrolases that may be involved in phosphate metabolism, arsenic resistance proteins, I'll get to that in a, in a little bit, um, organophosphorus transport, and a CP lyase. This is all found in one chromosomal segment, so this is all contiguous from the top and bottom strand, starting from FOR all the way to FinM. A priori, this is what I thought the extent of this genomic region was. As you'll see later, there are four genes 
upstream of FOR that were differentially regulated that conferred a real interesting property to these cells. So how do we determine um, what, what their phosphate response is, which genes are induced under, under uh, phosphate limitation in each strain? So the experimental design I used was similar to one that Adam Martini used for Prochlorococcus in 2006. I thought it was a real fantastic approach, so I decided to, to copy it. <laughs> to copy it. Um, uh, but it was really made possible by the fact that we could grow SAR11 on a defined medium. So this was my first PhD chapter developing this defined medium. So the two main aspects of that defined medium that made this possible, first of all, we could grow them to high cell yields high cell densities, so we could do these manipulations that require a lot of playing around much, much easier. Uh, previously, we had to tangential flow 20 liters down to get a pellet. Now we could do all of this in 10 mil vials um, relative to, to um, what we could do previously. So that really made it easier. The other thing is that we could make, get a phosphate and an organophosphate-free growth medium. So we could just exclude those compounds from the medium and actually limit them um, by those compounds. So uh, the way that we did this is, the way I did this is, is we uh, took a log phase culture and pelleted the cells and then split that pellet into two, two different conditions. Uh, one of those conditions, I washed the cells with phosphate replete medium. So essentially what I'm trying to do is mimic this log phase growth medium here. So this is our control. And the other one I simply excluded phosphate from. Then when we resuspended those washed cells in growth medium that had either excess phosphate or no phosphate. So the goal here, is, so that I should point out that these cells are viable. These, uh, in this condition, the cells actually do grow until they become carbon limited again. And these cells do not grow because they're phosphate limited. And this is exactly what we want. We want to see which genes are upregulated when they're phosphate limited. And we sampled these resuspensions at 0, 4, 20, and 38 hours for train, strain 1062. Then we added an extra two sample points for strain 7211. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment. All of this was done in triplicate, so there were three samples for this, three samples for this, and so on and so forth. So we could do um, analysis with actual statistics. So for each one of those um, uh, samples, I harvested the RNA and analyzed the gene expression with this ancient technology called DNA microarrays. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, and uh, then we compared the gene expression before the pos uh, between the plus phosphate and the minus phosphate treatments at each time point. So what I'm going to go through here is the, the results of that uh, for both strains. What I'm going to show you is a series of panels. This is essentially the, uh, the, the region of the chromosome uh, that have these genes located on it. If they're gray, they were not significantly differentially expressed. If they are some shade that is represented by this heat map, um, the degree of the shading represents the amount of upregulation under phosphate limiting conditions or downregulation under phosphate limiting conditions. Um, these actually should appear pinker than they do. They, they look kind of pink on my side screen, but not on my main one. I'm not sure why. Um, so anyway, so after four hours of phosphate limitation, strain 1062, again, this is the Oregon Coast strain, induces this PSTSCAB uh, operon. This is exactly what we expected. I'm very, I was very happy to see that. By 20 hours, you can see that that uh, PSTS, this is the periplasmic binding subunit, is cranked up to more than 30-fold higher expression uh, in phosphate limiting conditions relative to phosphate replete conditions, as well as some of these regulation genes downstream and this gene that I have had a feeling was a inorganic phosphate transporter. Um, there, uh, gene expression alone is not evidence of that, but uh, to see it upregulated might be uh, supporting that idea. We do see some other genes expressed, um, both upregulated and downregulated at 20 hours. So for those of you microbiology folks out here, you may recognize these genes. Um, these are SOS response genes. So this is a stress response in E. coli. So at 20 hours, if SAR11 strain 1062 doesn't get phosphate, they start inducing stress response proteins. This is a heat shock protein here. And you, then you see down regulation of genes usually associated with active growth. These are some cell division proteins, some tRNA modification and translation machinery, um, ribosomal proteins, uh, transcription machinery. 
I'm blanking on what fuse A is, but those are downregulated um, uh, as well. So my interpretation is that they need phosphate. If they don't get phosphate, they become stressed. And at 38 hours, we see a continued pattern of gene expression that's consistent with that interpretation as well. For strain 7211, it was very different. So this is the sargasso isolate that lives where there's not a lot of phosphate. So we saw um, at 72 and 96 hours some modest upregulation of our PSTS operon. We did not see any differential regulation at 420 or 38 hours for this strain. We don't know why, but I repeated it twice and got the same result both times. Um, perhaps, yeah, I don't know. I could speculate, but, but we didn't see it. However, at 72 hours, we saw this, this sort of pattern of gene regulation. But with our organophosphorus transporter, we saw a great degree of upregulation, um, suggesting that these cells may be targeting organophosphate compounds when they become phosphate stressed um, in favor of inorganic phosphate. Supporting that idea further is that we saw this CP lyase gene suite upregulated as well, suggesting they have the capacity to degrade organic uh, organophosphonates as well. Um, we didn't see any regulation of the polyphosphate enzymes. We did see a hydrolase here that may be involved in phosphate ester utilization, and we did see some arsenic resistance proteins upregulated. So arsenate and phosphate are structural analogs. Um, these transporters commonly accidentally transport arsenate, thinking it's phosphate, into the cell, and that's bad for the cell because although some some instances may suggest that arsenic is incorporated into DNA. Uh, it's really not. Um, so uh, what this does is it converts arsenate to arsenite, and then this is an aquaporin that efflux pumps that back out. If you re recall earlier, I said there were some genes upstream of FOR that were upregulated. These genes are annotated. Uh, two of them are annotated as putative hemolysins, which is a very general term. Then we have an RFAG-like glycosyl transferase and a metallophosphoesterase that were also upregulated. And this kind of had me scratching my head, and as I'll show you later, we believe we've identified the function of these genes. So linking these patterns to um, actual phenotype uh, in the lab is another, it's another step in the process of doing research like this. So we see the genes upregulated. What does that mean from a physiological standpoint? So this is just a truncated version of what I just showed you here, um, previously. It's in a little bit different order. This is all published. If you're interested in the publication, everything I show you here is all published. Uh, the link is down there. Um, so the, the a priori, uh, the, the prediction I had uh, for this is that they could only use phosphate, inorganic phosphate, for strain 1062. So we tested that explicitly on artificial seawater. What I'm showing you here is the maximum cell density achieved. In triplicate cultures, I noticed five minutes before the talk that my error bars are not on this particular slide. They show up on the next slide. Um, but this is the maximum yield as a function of phosphorus source. Our positive control is phosphate, so this should be an excess amount of phosphate. These are carbon limited at the, at the top here. And then this is our negative control. These are phosphate limited, um, and the, they're limited. I excluded phosphate from that condition. Then I tested phosphite, which is a reduced inorganic phosphorus compound, PO3, and then some phosphate esters. So these are the POC bonds here, and this is also a phosphate ester, phosphoserine. And then phosphonate. So this is methylphosphonic acid and 2-aminomethyl phosphonate. As you can see, 1062 didn't really use anything. We see a little bit of extra growth here with phosphite. I suspect that that's from either a trace contaminant of phosphate in the phosphite condition, or it's due to abiotic oxidation of phosphite to phosphate, although we did not explicitly test that. For strain 7211, we see a very different story. So strain 7211, which has all of the organophosphorus transporters and the CP lyase, uses just about everything we gave it in culture. Um, they definitely use phosphoserine. They're probably using the serine to meet some of their serine requirements. So these cells have a serine requirement. That's why you see the elevated um, cell yield here. So they dephosphorylate it and then are using the serine. But they're definitely able to use these two phosphonates. And they're definitely able to use the phosphate esters. 
I would like to point out that in all of these cases we observe dioxic growth and if you're interested in seeing that growth curve go check out the, publica the publication um, it's in there so they grew until they ran out of phosphate from the from the initial inoculum and then they stopped growing until they induced these genes and then they resumed growth using these other compounds as sole phosphorus sources. So immediately after I saw this result I keyed in on one of these compounds in particular as being potentially important for for um, ocean biogeochemistry. This is methylphosphonic acid so this is a phosphonate. Remember I said that this is a PC bond. When this is cleaved in other organisms, so like E. coli or some pseudomonads, methane gas is released. Uh, for those of you that uh, study methanogens, you know that methanogens only make methane in anoxic conditions. This process can actually happen aerobically. It's not technically methanogenesis per se, but methane is released during this. So at the time in our lab we were studying whether or not SAR11 oxidized methyl groups because we, we, there's some, uh, some papers from the Giovanoni lab showing that certain methyl groups can be oxidized for energy and looking at this you, you might think well is, does it oxidize it or does it release methane? You can't really do both. So we explicitly tested this and the way we did that is by incubating SAR11 in sealed bottles in artificial growth medium. What you're looking at here is the cell density uh, over time I apologize, it's not on a semi-log plot. Um, that was a request by a reviewer. Uh, but uh, we have uh, um, our negative control right here. This is no phosphate added, showing that they are phosphate limited in these bottles. When you add inorganic phosphate, the cell density increases. Those are the circles. When you add methylphosphonate, cell density increases um, as well. And then we measured methane in the headspace of these vials and extrapolated it to the total dissolved methane in the bottle. And what you see here is that when in the presence of, in, of phosphate there is no methane evolved at all. Um, that hovers around zero. And when methylphosphonate is added as a phosphorus source they evolve methane stoichiometric to their phosphorus demand. So this really shows that they're not oxidizing that methyl group, that they are releasing it as methane. And this all of a sudden has some geochemical implications potentially um, in the ocean. So microbial uh, oceanographers have really known for a long time that the surface waters of a lot of marine ecosystems are super saturated with methane and that that methane is probably from a biotic source but the isotopic signature doesn't quite match that of anoxic um, methanogenesis so basically uh, classical methanogenesis. In 2008, Dave Carl came up with this hypothesis that perhaps marine microbes that were starved for phosphate were actually demethylating methylphosphonate and that was one of the sources of that excess methane in the surface waters. And they did some experiments that showed very nicely that marine mi microbes in fact do release methane uh, when they're phosphate starved. The thing that was missing from that paper was a source of methylphosphonate. So at the time we didn't really know if there was a natural source. So it's a great hypothesis, but if there's no methylphosphonate in the water column, um, it kind of doesn't, it may not be important. That all changed with the publication of a paper a couple years ago when um, Bill Metcalf's group at Champaign-Urbana showed that nitrous and palmolus maritimus, a marine group one thaumarchia, which are extremely abundant in nature, has this de novo synthesis pathway for methylphosphonate. So all of a sudden we have a superabundant archaea potentially producing methylphosphonate that SAR11 or other microbes can demethylate and form this methane. The story is far from over though, so we don't still have any direct measurements of methylphosphonate in the ocean. There was a recent paper that showed perhaps um, a, a relationship between sinking particles and methylphosphonate production, uh, sorry, methane production from sinking particles. Maybe that methylphosphonate is associated with sinking particles as part of organic matter. Um, there's still a lot of research to do about this, um, but, but I think we're getting closer to the true answer of this. So I want to transition a little bit away from um, the use of organophosphorus compounds and focus on what those mystery genes I was telling you about a little bit earlier were doing. Um, this really bothered me when I saw these upregulated because I'm like, you know, what, what are these things doing? 
I, I, it just didn't make sense to me. The annotations were not real, not real great in most of the databases I, I searched. So uh, again, these are two hemolysins. Uh, hemolysin like so a hemolysin is a, a potentially lyses red blood cells um, uh, I don't know about that in this case then we have an RFAG like glycosyl transferase and a metallophosphoesterase uh, the first step in doing this after scouring some of the um, sequence similarity databases was to uh, recruit Cameron to to help me with this because um, he's very good at, at um, uh, constructing some of these phylogenetic trees and doing some ortholog searches and what he did is used the amino acid sequences from these four genes to create uh, clusters with a program named HAL and HAL basically identifies these ortho groups of orthologous clusters in different organisms and he constructed this tree on the left so this is just a 16S phylogeny and what you're looking at here is um, um, whether or not there's an orthologous gene in each of these organisms. If the box is open, there's no ortholog. If it's filled in, there is an ortholog. If there's a black line between them, those genes are adjacent to one another in the chromosome. So this is from strain 7211, and using this HAL pipeline, we have strain 7211 showing that all four of these genes are in order. Uh, in other SAR11s, these are all SAR11s, we see that the glycosyl transferase is present in some of them, but none of the other genes are. And in HIMB59, which is a Pacific Ocean isolate, we actually have this glycosyl transferase and the metallophosphoesterase adjacent to one another. This is a truncated version of a larger tree showing the whole uh, alpha proteobacteria, but I'm going to show you a small segment of that tree because it's the most important part of the tree, really. Um, it turns out that four, three of these orthologs have actually been cloned and um, characterized in the lab and it took me a while to find this literature but once I did I, I realized we had something pretty special going on here so in Cinerizobium um, they apparently changed the name of that organism to Encifer Encifer it used to be Cinerizobium I don't know check Wikipedia there's a whole dialogue of discussion about it um, as it turns out uh, gene A here has been cloned and characterized it's OLSB it is a gene that catalyzes the first step in ornithine lipid biosynthesis. Okay, so typically next to OLSB in ornithine lipid or synthesizing organisms is OLSA. This is not OLSA, um, unfortunately. It would have been really great if it was. However, it has protein domain signatures that are very similar to OLSA. So we're going to call it OLSA-like. Um, uh, so it kind of looks like OLSA catalyzes the second step of ornithine lipid synthesis. So it kind of looks like maybe they're inducing genes to make ornithine lipids which lack phosphate. Um, gene B here, ortholog B here, also from Cinerizobium, was recently characterized in a really fantastic paper to uh, encode PLSC, which is a phospholipase C, which catalyzes the first step in lipid renovation under phosphate stress in cinerizobium. What this does is it cleaves off phospholipids, leaving your uh, polar head group uh, that contains phosphate and a diacyl glycerol that doesn't have a polar head group. And this third gene right here, C, in agrobacterium was very recently described last year, in fact, to be a uh, promiscuous glycosyl transferase that, trans that um, glycosylates diacyl glycerols with either glucose or glucuronic acid. So we all of a sudden have this system where we may be synthesizing phosphate-free lipids under phosphate stress and or uh, remodeling phospholipids and replacing them with glycolipids under phosphate stress. This is something that was previously predicted to be absent in all SAR11s. Um, there was a prediction that SAR11 has an obligately high requirement for phosphate, uh, for phospholipid phosphate, I'm sorry. So for those of you that geek out by molecular structures, we have, um, this is the predicted pathway um, uh, of each of these processes. So we have ornithine here, it's acylated by OLSB to form lysoornithine lipid, and then another acyl group is transferred to that right here to form functional ornithine lipid. This is the polar head group, and this is the lipid part of, of the uh, the lipid, and then 
This is classic phospholipid biosynthesis as we believe it occurs in SAR11s. Glycerophosphate um, is turned into phosphatidylethanolamine. This is a very common phospholipid or phosphatidylglycerol. This is another common phospholipid. Again, these are the polar head groups that are on the outside of the cell, right here and right here, and then these are the acyl, um, uh, the, the fatty acid aspect. So what we think is happening is under phosphate stress, these are being cleaved off. So um, this PLC, PLCP, the phospholipase C, uh, cleaves off the phosphate-containing head group, leaving a diacylglycerol in both instances. And, and then the glycosyl transferase comes in and adds uh, glucose or glucuronic acid to these to form GADG, which is glucuronic acid diacylglycerol, and this is monoglucosyl diacylglycerol as well. So this is what we think is happening. But thinking and showing it are two different things. So, um, so we explicitly tested this. This again is very similar to the, the resuspension assays I did for the gene expression. So we grew cells in phosphate replete conditions then resuspended them into different uh, phosphorus regimes. Um, and what we're monitoring here is the cell density over time. And then at each one of these black dots with the help of Ben Van Mui's lab at Hui, um, we ascertained whether or not uh, they were making lipids other than phospholipids. So when they're grown with excess phosphate, so this is growth media with excess phosphate in it, we see that most of the phospholipids are in fact either PG, which is phosphatidyl uh, glycerol or phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So these are all phospholipids when they're grown in phosphate replete. There's a tiny sliver of GADG and carbon limited stationary phase. I'm not really sure why that shows up, but it's less than 1%. So in general, they're all phospholipids. When you resuspend these cells in phosphate free growth medium or low phosphate growth medium, they don't grow appreciably, but they do transform up to 40% of their lipids to these phosphate free analogs. So we have um, immediately within, well, within two days, of uh, resuspension in these phosphate-free conditions, we see uh, GADG, MGDG, and ornithine lipids synthesized, and they can account for up to 40% of the total uh, lipid content of the cell under phosphate starvation. We also wanted to see what happened when you did this with methylphosphonic acid as an organophosphorus source, because there's not really a lot of literature out there about whether uh, these cells are doing that, you know, if they have excess organic phosphate, are they going to do the same thing? Uh, so this is, again, is a resuspension with excess methylphosphonic acid over time. And, in fact, they do synthesize non-phosphorous lipids um, when they're uh, grown in the presence of methylphosphonate. It does look like some of that phosphate makes its way back into phospholipids. You can see that the amount of non-phosphorous lipids decrease over time. Uh, a stand we... we investigated this further and grew these cells on methylphosphonic acid for about 30 generations and then looked at the lipids. And there's about a 10 to 20 percent standing stock of non-phosphorous lipids in cells grown exclusively on methylphosphonate. So while during this transition they actually swap out a high percent, even if there's excess organophosphorus compounds, they synthesize uh, a little bit of non-phosphorous lipids. It's interesting, I'm not going to show it here, but it'll be in the paper. When you starve these cells for methylphosphonate, they convert up to 70% of their total lipids to non-phosphorous lipids. So we actually think that this ability is in response, perhaps, to patchiness in the dissolved organic phosphorus pool instead of the dissolved inorganic phosphorus pool. So when we look at the, the changes in, in polar lipid head group stoichiometry and relative to some other organisms, we see some interesting things. This, of course, um, uh, helps us understand ocean processes and the, and the relationship between ocean processes related to phosphate starvation and cellular stoichiometry. So cyanobacteria, which don't make phospholipids, have a very low P to C molar ratio. They make sulfolipids that have carbon and sulfur in them. They don't have phosphate or nitrogen in them. But some other heterotrophs do. And when you look at the polar head group stoichiometry, these have a fairly high P to C molar ratio and a fairly high N to C molar ratio. Roseobacter, um, I believe these synthesize ornithine lipids, and that's why 
I, I believe. I think that's why you're seeing um, uh, the, the, the deviance between these. When you look at phosphate replete, 7211 and strain 1062 that does not synthesize these alternate lipids in either phosphate replete or phosphate deplete conditions. We see a molar ratio slightly lower in the P to C than some of the other um, some of the other heterotrophs. But when you starve these cells for phosphate, that drops uh, about 50 percent. So the molar ratio. So this means there's less phosphorus in their uh, in their outer membranes or in their membranes relative to phosphate replete, and that's just kind of showing what we, um, we just showed before. What was the most surprising aspect of this work is that methylphosphate actually grouped with this minus phosphate treatment. So this implies that even in the presence of excess organic phosphorus compounds, we have a decreased molar ratio. So how do some SAR11 and phosphate famine? Um, First of all, they make extensive use of a poorly de defined, poorly characterized dissolved organic phosphorus pool, probably. Um, this is a really uh, interesting area to me to investigate uh, further. Uh, there's lots of dissolved organic phosphorus compounds. Which ones do they use? How efficiently do they use them? Are all questions that we don't have the answer to. They also reduce their peak quota by synthesizing phospholipids, even and especially when they're using DOP. So this could be an adaptation to patchiness in the DOP pool, as I mentioned previously, um, instead of looking for patchiness in the organic phosphorus pool, or sorry, the inorganic phosphorus pool. And I suspect that polyphosphate plays a role, but this needs more investigation. So I ran out of time is the short answer. Um, we believe that there is some, are some polyphosphate dynamics going on with SAR11 and that they probably do synthesize polyphosphate under certain conditions, but that definitely needs more investigation. So um, when you look at this in the bigger picture, because this pro these processes result in a reduction of cellular P to C ratios, it really impacts our understanding of ocean processes related to cellular elemental stoichiometry and really shows how different environmental parameters can cause deviations in P to C ratios. And of the, of the findings we have here, I think the most surprising is that um, the cells grown on methylphosphonate also synthesized phosphorus-free lipids. It might be expected that cells couldn't distinguish between where their phosphorus comes from, but we show pretty clearly that uh, alternate lipid synthesis machinery and organophosphorus utilization are both uh, induced by phosphate starvation at the same time. And it suggests that uh, SAR11 growing with plenty of phosphorus also synthesized non-phosphorus lipids and thus have reduced PDC ratios. So this has kind of a potential, maybe, I don't know, I'd like to think it does, to, to alter our con concept of phosphorus cycling by changing the estimates of the impact of phosphate limitation on productivity um, and biomass accumulation. So when there's no phosphate, there are going to be deviations in that P to C ratio, but what about dissolved organic phosphate? I think that's much, uh, needs a lot more exploration. Um, and hopefully it'll expand our knowledge of specific adaptations to phosphate scarcity. So with that, I will take any and all questions you may have. All right. Thanks, Paul. We're going to um, turn off some or turn back on microphones now. So anyone okay. have questions, feel free to tweet them to us either at microseminar or using the hashtag useminar. Uh, and anyone in the Hangout want to turn on their mic and ask a question? Well, we have one on Twitter from uh, from John Battlemendi. Uh, he says, "Paul, with more ways to assimilate phosphorus, P, does HTCC seventy two eleven have a larger genome than PUB?" Slightly. So it's uh, what a hundred thousand base pairs, Cameron. I think it's yeah, it's I think it's very barely. very slight. It's one of the so, bigger. Yeah, it is one of the bigger SAR eleven genomes for sure. Yeah. That's a really good question. So, um, and it's a it's a really good point. I didn't have time to touch on. So, we think that these organisms are under a lot of selection to reduce genome size because of uh, uh, overhead co to, to alleviate the overhead cost of replication in nutrient poor environments. But when you look at these cells and a lot of metagenomes, there's a clear investment in the Sargasso Sea. Um, in phosphate acquisition and utilization machinery by these, these organisms. 
And there's a really great paper by uh, Maureen Coleman and, and, and Penny Chisholm that show that the Sargasso Sea is actually, in, this, in terms of SAR-11, enriched in the presence of these phosphate acquisition proteins, or genes, I guess, the genes. Good question. So I have a question, Paul. So when we go through these classical ways to characterize a microbe, right, you grow it up in culture and you have to then harvest the membrane and characterize the lipid content in terms of what's in it. Um, so with what you're showing, I mean, where do you think that puts, like, where do you think we should now be thinking about is that a required thing for describing a genus and species of a cultivated organism, or should we be thinking more broadly about just genomic context? So if I'm interpreting your question right, it, it, you're asking, um, you know, lipid profiles are used as one of these uh, phenotypic differences, typically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, if you grow SAR-11 up under one condition, they're going to have a different signature than under a different condition. And whether or not we should be using that to classify genus and species, I don't know. I think I'll avoid that question uh, altogether. <laughs> I'll but, say hell no. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you see that in other things too, right? I mean, yeah. there's fatty acid content in general changes depending on growth conditions in yeah. one strain. So yeah, it's a, you can't, you know, if you can't grow every organism under exact same conditions, I'm not sure what that tells you. Right. <clears throat> All right, anyone else there have questions for Paul? I love that you hit everything in your talk. You had, like, total, like, hipster molecular diagrams and even a microarray. Wow. A microarray, I know. <laughs> I've, I've moved on. I've moved on from that. Now, now we're dealing with RNA-seq data. Yeah, microarrays are still good. So yeah, I know. Just make sure you get a sequencing gel in your next talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we start putting up a uh, yeah bucket list talk for a... All right. Well, I think you have overwhelmed everyone with the amount of data you've given us, and there are no other questions coming in that I can see. Anyone want to log in and ask a question in person? Everyone's, like, got their mics off. So like, oh. All right. Well, that's one, one question for you also, Paul, is if you had to go after another group, Dr. Oligotroph, right? Of, mar <laughs> of marine microbes? Well, at any, any, any microbial group where we may or may not have genetic information already, but if you had to go after any group, what would you go after in terms of pulling the culture next, hopefully having genomic context? I'm going to be a little cagey on that one. Because um, that's your best talk of now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be just a slight amount of caginess. Um, I will say I think there's a lot of diversity in soil that's uncultivated that would be worthwhile to uh, cultivate. That's where I'm going to leave. Totally. If, if, it, if it had to be marine, if it had to be marine, I would definitely uh, be targeting SAR-86, and I would um, be encouraging experiments like this with SAR-116. Anything, anything that gets out of the euphotic zone is going to grow too slow for me, I think. So... <laughs> What so is I'm, too I'm gonna, slow for you, considering what you're working on now? What's that? What is too slow for you as a growth rate? Well, I guess it depends on my career stage. Um, so we're at four days now with the Thaumarchia under optimal conditions as a doubling time, a four-day doubling time. That has been as long as 14 days um, in suboptimal cultivation conditions. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, on certain time scales, that's too long. Um, for a career, I think it's a great it's a great bug to study. All right. Well, thanks for doing this so much, Paul. And if you have questions, please contact him through Twitter or email, and I'm sure yep. he'll be happy to answer you. Yep. Thank right. you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, that was awesome. Yep. <laughs>